Hello, this is a discussion of the syllabus. Um, I know I'm using a specific class you know, for an example, but your class should be about the same, even though not all the sections are going to be identical. So let's go ahead and kind of go through the syllabus. I'm not going to read every single sentence because that will bore you and myself to death, which is not good. So we're going to start with course description. Obviously, this is just you know describing the course and also the student learning outcomes. Uh, this section is dependent on which class you are taking. And then we have class information, which is basically about the section number, as well as you know where the class meets and where it is meeting, um, and also the duration of the class. I'm only teaching on campus full semester classes so you know that should be you know, this part is not going to be the same but it should be similar between classes section three talks about me my name is tech all young this is my email address my phone number my phone number actually get to my uh, team's account so that means you know if you just leave a message you know I don't have to be in my office to you know uh, get your message so that's really nice um, I am in office a little more than most other professors, so if you stop by and you see me in the office, just come in and we can talk. These are my official office hours on Mondays and Wednesdays. It is from 11 to 12 o'clock. On Tuesday, Thursdays, it is from 4.30 to 5.30. And then on um, Fridays, it is from 8 to 9. I believe this is outdated. So I need to update this. So I do apologize that this is going to be you know changed because uh, I don't think they reflect the correct office hours for this semester. All right, um, and then we have important dates. This is a link to the academic calendar of the college. So if you want to know when to drop with a refund, when you when to drop with a uh, when to, the last day to add with a permission number. And also when to drop, you know, with a W notation, you know, these this calendar will give you all that information. Um, my classes are all on campus, fully on campus classes. So the final exam schedule will determine on which day and what time we are going to have our final exam. So you can look it up and find out for yourself. Um, because I'm only teaching in-person classes, so that means you know it, this section here is fairly simple. There's reading material from the Canvas shell. You know I do in-person lectures. You know full face to face. I do record my lectures, and my lectures recordings are available on YouTube for free and without commercials. So you can actually check it out here you know, whenever you want to. Um, in regular effective contact. Um, to stay in touch with me, I highly encourage everybody to come visit me in my office. Um, as far as email is concerned, um, you know, just send me an email. I mean that everybody knows me you know, what that is about. You can also use the Canvas shell to message me, you know, which is which works just as well as email. Expectation of time frame: the turnaround time is about a day or no more than a day during the week, and it is going to be. Um, no more than two days um, during the weekend or your know, holidays um, okay so we are moving on to accommodations um, you know, go visit the DSPS if you need the disability accommodation and make sure that you let me know ahead of time before uh, a test uh, typically a week before a test would be good so that basically means as soon as I announce there's a midterm you know, or the final exam it's time to let me know um, and then we have student conduct uh, the college has a really good web page on um, expectations of behavior and conduct already so I really don't have to repeat every single point here um, academic honesty and integrity is super important in my classes so that means you know um, I will enforce that now there's one thing that I want to um, emphasize is you know the way I define academic integrity also includes uh, rule compliance and truthfulness in all class related activities such as road taking because I have seen people 
trying to sign in for somebody else or you know pass on a your know, code you know if it is done online to a student who's actually not in class i would consider those as academic dishonesty so you know now that you know what i classify as the academic dishonesty um well okay it's just good to know i'm not gonna say anymore um, the non-academic, non-integrity conduct expectations are just as you know, what the college is expecting. Um, these are specific items that I want to address a little bit. Uh, chatting in class is distracting to all the students around you. Uh, well, I should, okay, I take it back. Not around you, but around the person who's chatting. Um, so, you know, um, if you have any questions about the class material, uh, raise your hand and I will be more than happy to address that. Um, other than that, you know, um, chatting between students, you know, is not going to be productive, you know, because, you know, that's just going to distract, you know, people uh, from, you know, paying attention in class. I will probably try to integrate more um, peer to peer time in my uh, lectures so that there will be a time you know, where you guys, you know, uh, students can talk to each other to try to clarify concepts and so on. Uh, devices should be silenced in the class. If you're expecting something um, that is important to you, um, just turn your phone to silence, you know, and no vibration. So you can basically, you know, see the message on your phone. And if you need to reply, you know, on your know, via text, you can do so in class. But if you need to carry on a conversation, you know, please step out of the classroom before you start the conversation. Um, other disruptions, you know, uh, it is impossible for me to list every single possible way that um, a person can disrupt the class. So just let me know if you experience you know, some kind of disruption that I do not seem to be aware of. Um, bullying is not going to be tolerated at all. So any such case is going to be reported. And then threatening is also not going to be tolerated. You know, if I know of any cases of you know someone being threatened in my class, I will report all of those to the to administration. All right, section ten is important: absences and um, you know attendance. So basically, I will take role in my classes. Sometimes I will forget, but most of the time I do remember, and I will take role because. Um, it's a structure. Um, you are taking a in-person class, and as such, you know, being in class is expected. And I'll just say that you know, people who tend to have more absences, generally speaking, you know, do not succeed as much in a class um, because you know, it's. I know my lectures are recorded, and people can watch the entire thing online. You know, you know, outside of lecture. But it is not the same as in lecture. There are many differences between watching a video of a class recording versus actually being there in class. So the way I do this is um, the um, excuse policy or the absence policy is I allow people up to five absences. No questions asked. Okay, I will be keeping track. But no questions asked. People do not have to tell me why they miss a class, and that can be done up to five times, which is way more than um, the six percent of um, excessive you know, absences. Because you know, to meet the six percent excessive absences, two classes will meet that already. In other words, the second absence is already um, you know, kind of moving into the excessive you know, portion. So this is more than twice the amount of absences to be counted as excessive. So five absences, you know, no questions asked. It can be as simple as I did not wake up in time. My alarm didn't work, okay, to my car broke down, or I could not arrange daycare for my children on this day, or I'm sick. So all of that, you know, can use, you know, these five absences. Um, Considering of excuses, so some absences can be excused and not count toward the five absences. Now, to be um, on the average, when I observe my students, the average student, 
most students will not use up the five absences at all, not even come close, okay? They might miss a class or two um, due to um, you know, certain reasons, you know, that are not even under their control. So they can have a job interview, they may have, um, you know, unexpected, you know, uh, events happening, like, a, like their parents getting sick and they have to stay home and, you know, uh, help you know take care of the parents or children and for that matter um, even with those all counted in um, an average student cannot even come close to using up all five absences but in case somebody you know has special reasons to be absent I would say you'll first use up the five and uh, you know um, absences that are allowable uh, use up the allowance and then you know if there are any additional absences that are required I will consider the, the excuses. So in that case, you know, I am going to, you know, it would be up to my discretion. In other words, you know, uh, unless there is a verifiable reason and I deem it to be reasonable, reasonable being, um, first, it is not something the student has control over. Two, it is significant enough that, you know, the, it's a, it's a reason that someone is going to be absent and so on. Um, I would go like, okay, fine, you know, um, it's excused and, you know, it does not count to the uh, one of the five, you know, absences and so on. Um, the final exam, I mean, excuse me, not the final, but exams are different because, you know, with exams, I have to be a little bit more stringent in terms of, you know, what can be excused. Um, so in the case of exams, um, tell me ahead of time before the start time of the exam. Um, if somebody is sick, you know, um, that should be enough lead time just to send me an email before the start time of the exam um, that, you know, okay, I'm sick, you know, I have a doctor's note, I went to, you know, Kaiser, or I went to the healthcare place and I got a doctor's note and here it is. So do that prior to the start time of the exam. Uh, there's one exception here. Um, let's see here. To do. So the exception is you know, when the uh, illness is uh, acute. Um, so certain type of you know, illness you know, just happens, and there's not much time you can you know deal with both the illness, go to the hospital, and email me at the same time. So in those cases, it's okay to, to give me the uh, doctor's note you know after the event. Um, but that's going to be, you know, the, the sickness, okay, right here. The sickness has to be of an acute uh, nature. Um, I don't need to know exactly what the illness is, but I do need the physician, your doctor, to write on a note that the sickness is of an acute nature in order to have the doctor's note um, sent to me after uh, missing an exam. In those cases, I can... Uh, give a makeup exam to those people. All right, so we're moving on to grading. Um, so grading is important because you know I want to let people know, you know what is the nature of my assessments, your know, exams, you know, to be more uh, specific. So I don't bother to test prior knowledge and recall because the exams are all open note and open no open note and open book. So what is the purpose, you know, if, I, if this is what I'm testing, you know, when I have an open book and open note, you know, exam. So what I'll be really testing instead are these three areas. The first one is analysis and critical thinking. The second one is synthesis and problem solving. So these two are closely related. Analysis and critical thinking is about taking things apart. And then synthesis and problem solving is basically, you know, how do you put things back together in order to solve a particular problem? So, you know, they're kind of linked. The first one is always necessary in order for the second one to work. The third one is performance. Let me explain this a little bit. Um, in previous semesters, in almost every semester, I have people telling me, if I have just a little bit more time, I can finish the entire test. Um, well how much time it takes to solve, you know, to answer the questions is part of the assessment. Um, in other words, your proficiency is part of what I'm assessing as well. Now, the good news is, you know, most of the time, I cannot promise, but I, most of the time, 
I would use um, typically the 90 percentile score of a class and convert it into the 100 percent, you know, for scaling purposes. In other words, um, let's just say that we have 30 people in the class and the person ranked 27 ha is, has a score of 75%. Okay, that's typically it's not going to be that bad, but just, like, just for the sake of argument, it is 75%. So what I would do in that case is I'm going to scale the 75% to 100% and that ratio is applied universally across all students in the class. So somebody may ask, so what about you know, the first, uh, the person who's ranked first and maybe that person actually got 100% out of 100%? Well, that person is gonna scale the same way. In this case, it is um, the same as dividing by three and multiply by four. So that means you know, the person who ranked first is gonna end up with 133% uh, um, of the original score It's gonna be uh, it's gonna have quote unquote overflow. So the overflow you know, basically flows into the overall score and that person you know, can use that to make up for some of the points that are lost in some other assessments. So that's basically how I can kind of make sure that, you know, the, that I don't make a test like super hard and the highest score is only like 80%. It's not a problem because I rescale you know, the 90 percentile score to 100%. All right. Okay. Wait. Hold on. There's one more thing. <laughs> what if the whole class? Okay. What if the lowest score in the entire class is already a ninety percent? Am I going to do anything about it? The answer is no. I'm not going to do anything about that. I mean, if the whole class is doing brilliantly in an exam, the whole class can get an A. I don't have a problem with that. It is only when you know I make a test a little bit too hard that the highest score is much lower than what I would expect that I rescale the whole class you know, to um, you know, the 90 percentile um, score, you know, and, and look at the, uh, I, let me be more specific. I look at the 90 percentile score as a 100 percent. All right. So typically when I score something, you know, with each item in a uh, rubric, <coughs> everything is scaled from zero to four, just like your GPA. So this is basically what it means when someone get a zero, a one, a two, a three, and a four. So the zero and the four are the easy one to explain. A zero means no work is submitted or the work does not show any evidence whatsoever of the ability to analyze and think critically or the ability to synthesize or problem solve. And then a four out of four is also simple because the submitted work provides sufficient evidence of the ability to analyze and think critically, to synthesize, to problem solve, to you know, everything is complete and correct, um, operationally correct, and excellent familiarity and or efficiency. So that's basically you know, what zero and four are for, and they are not surprising because zero out of four is an F, and the four out of four is an A. So it is the stuff that is in between that is mm, kind of harder to explain and judge. So one out of four, which is essentially a letter grade of D, is that the submitted work shows some but insufficient evidence of the ability to analyze and think critically, to synthesize or problem solve, and the familiarity and efficiency do not, do not matter in this case because um, there's insufficient uh, uh, evidence of the ability to analyze and or synthesize. So 50% is the letter grade of C, which is also considered to be a quote unquote passing grade is the submitted work shows sufficient evidence, in this case, of the ability to analyze and think, to synthesize and problem solve. The submitted work also shows evidence of the one or more conceptual mistake. So this is important. It is a conceptual non essence I wouldn't say that it's not a key concept, but it is one of the concepts you're know, being tested is conceptual, I'd see conceptual mistake insufficient familiarity and or efficiency. So a B is somewhere between a C and an A, and what does it mean? It means you know, it meets all the requirements of a C, but it, the submitted work shows evidence of one or more operational as opposed to conceptual mistake and or omission. So that means you know, what is an operational error or mistake versus a conceptual mistake. An operational mistake is one that is um, 
obviously because oh you know um, when someone copy um, let's say a number from one line to the next line um, it's off by one digit okay that would be an operational error but you know to change you know, what should be a multiplication to a division is a conceptual error um, all right so that's basically how I gauge um, you know uh, evaluate you know the performance from one out of four to four out of four so at the end of the semester I add up all the points that would be your score and if the overall score is greater than or equal to 85 point 87.5% which is 7 eighths uh, that's an A between 62.5% and 87.5% that's a B and so on so you can see that this is not the typical scale that starts with 60%. You know, 0 to 60% is an F, 60 to 70 is a D, and so on. I'm just using the GPA you know, all along in the semester. Um, late and makeup policy, that is also important. This is independent, even though it's related to absence you know, uh, policy or attendance policy. So typically, I do not take late submission, but in certain cases, see the italic here, the, proof, the instructor may agree to late submissions. The very the verifiable reasons of a late submission should be provided to the instructor in uh, prior to the due date. So this is kind of important. You know, the keyword here is verifiable. For instance, um, you know, I have um, my boss asked me for a late shift um, for a particular uh, day, and as a result, you know, I cannot uh, be in the lab or you know um, I cannot turn in the homework assignment on time so I have to you know it has to be verifiable in the case of a homework assignment which you usually has a week one week of uh, uh, of time to turn in the homework assignment um, even that is not going to be a good reason to get an extension um, because you know I think you know it's, um, knowing how to manage time is an important thing and I'll, I'll address that in just a moment okay how to uh, how to uh, manage time so we'll we'll get to that we'll get back to that one um, and then the specific to exams of makeup is possible only if all of the following conditions are satisfied the instructor agrees to the makeup and the reason of the makeup the reason of the makeup is or are satisfactorily satisfactorily um, verifiable the request of the makeup is prior to the scheduled date time of the exam so what this means is if you think that you might need to uh, ask for a makeup exam you can always ask however there's you know there's no guarantee that I would agree to it so you know just communicate with me okay communicate with me as early as possible okay so the moment you know that oh I might not be able to make it to that exam let me know um, and also you know, be prepared that I might ask you for verification alright so let's talk about all the assessments here you know, for this class uh, homework assignments and lab activities typically make up no, not typically make up for 20% the first exam is 20% the second exam is 20% and then the final exam is 40% of the grade for this class. Um, and then we have a you know, list of the topics of this class. And I think this is incorrect for 440. So I have a, quite a few things to fix you know, for this class because I think I mistakenly thought that uh, 440 is a Tuesday, Thursday class, but it really is a Monday, Wednesday class for this semester. So I'm going to fix that. All right, getting back to something that I mentioned earlier, which is time management. And other things that you probably know already, but if you don't, you know, they, they may be useful. So this link here is for time budgeting and management. Um, so if this is something that you struggle with, and I have to say that I struggle with this as well. Okay, you know, sometimes I spend too much time on things that are interesting to me and I do not have enough time for things that really I need to do so it happens to me as well so you know it breaks up into time budgeting which is basically making sure that there's enough time to go around and once you have enough time to go around you know this part here time management you know talks about you know how to use that time effectively 
and having a structure which is basically you know just um, regularity like when I'm supposed to do what in a, on a, which day you know that is important and then for short time a short term um, planning um, it is also, you know, it's basically this boils down to a tactical plan of how to use our time. So you have to look at you know, all the things that you have to do and then you prioritize which one needs to be done first and so on. Um, and then we talk about, you know, uh, this is an example of workflow, basically long term, medium plan and short term planning. And then this part talks about habitualization. How do you practice all this stuff and turn it into a habit so that you don't have to think about it, you know, to actually make use of time effectively. So this is actually important because, you know, uh, once you graduate from a college and you get a job, okay, your boss is not going to be, um, I would say, as lenient uh, when it comes to, you know, missing deadlines and, you know, um, not being with, not being able to show up at work and so on. So you probably want to, you know, kind of manage your time or know how to manage your time so that, you know, whenever, you know, there, there will still be occasions where you, you'll, be, you'll be late or, you know, you simply cannot show up at work because of, you know, things that are not under your control. But occasional, you know, um, tardiness and occasionally, you know, not being able to, miss, to meet deadlines is going to be okay because your boss can look at your overall performance and go like, yeah, this person is usually, you know, on time, usually getting things done, you know, on time and, you know, show up at work, uh, good worker, you know, you know, when there are unforeseen, unforeseeable events happening and this person really cannot, you know, meet all the deadline or show up at work, it's going to be okay because, you know, I don't think I can hire anyone, you know, who can be better than this person. See, that's the key, right? You know, you want to show your boss that, you know, you're already, you know, um, at the higher percentile in terms of, you know, being effective at work. So your boss will really have to think twice before thinking about, I think I'm going to hire the next person and the next person is going to be better, be better than this person. So you want to, you know, basically make sure that your boss, you know, has that impression. So that's one. And let me go back here. Uh, taking and maintaining notes is also important, you know, because I know that not everybody uh, in my classes know how to take and maintain notes. So this one is about, you know, how to do that. Um, and I will talk about this in class too, you know, and I will basically say, okay, now would be a good time for you to write down some notes on this, okay? Or to write down the definition or go to the definition section of your notes and add this item to that section. So I will be prompting people to do that. Um, but taking notes is definitely important if you want to perform well in a class. Uh, this one is a little bit of a, there's a certain complexity to this one. Um, an example of how to understand something. It relates to taking notes, but it's more than that. Okay, it is more about you know, the approach of how do you understand you know, a concept, especially something that may be abstract or complex or difficult. So <clears throat> the way you read this is you don't want to start reading, you know, the stuff that is not in a box beyond um, section three. Okay, so section three is still okay if you, you know, to read everything. The boxes contain things that are, you know, that are not domain specific. Whereas, you know, from section four and on, I'll be talking about you know, quantum computing. So unless you have an intrinsic um, interest in quantum computing, the stuff that is not in a box is going to be a little hard to read. However, the stuff in the box is about the approach. Okay, It's about the approach of how do you dig through something that is difficult to understand. So that is what you need to focus on is the stuff that are in the boxes, okay? Because none of these would actually reference quantum computing. I mean, you see quantum computing here, but it's really just illustrating a you know the the concept of a nested list in order to keep track of you know what you're what you're trying to study or what you're trying to understand. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff like this. So that is. I think this is one of the more important module, even though it is a little bit harder to dig through. 
Um, but if you are not used to um, taking classes that involve your complex or abstract concepts, you know, um, this can be helpful. Um, this one is also interesting, you know, uh, GitHub plus Markdown OER, what does it mean to you? Okay, so I'll, I'll pop up to that module. So this one talks about, you know, how I'm converting most of my um, OER, Open Education Resources, which is basically all the notes, okay, you know, I don't use textbooks. All the stuff that you need for the, the, my classes are authored by myself, but they're OER, which means you, know, you can use it too. So this basically talks about what you can do with such a resource. You can basically copy and paste it, you know, to your own notes, and then you can add to it. So it talks about how that is, uh, how that can be done. Um, MBTI Meyer Briggs Type Indicator Personality Assessment. This is actually kind of important, even though it does not seem to be important. Um, this is one of many sites you know, that can uh, that offers this kind of test for free. You can you know, click on take the test without even logging in, and you can um, you can find out more about yourself. The reason why this part can be important is I think there should be an alignment between um, a person's interests, um, aptitude, and you know the career that person wants to take on. So I think this is important from that perspective. And then this is the um, uh, what they call the outlook, the job outlook from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and that is important too because you know this will give you an idea of what options you have in the future. Okay, what kind of jobs are available? What is the uh, expected growth of those you know kinds of jobs and so on? So these are all resources to you, and this section is also common to all my classes. So it doesn't matter which class you're in, you know, this section is going to be here. All right, so I think that covers everything that I want to cover. Um, even though I talked about the syllabus, please read it, okay? Because, you know, particularly because I might be making some changes because I think I just spotted myself to use the wrong uh, office hours for this semester. So that means it's going to be updated. So read the entire syllabus, okay, and highlight the sections that may be of interest or importance to you, uh, so they can get back to those sections you know, uh, quicker. Uh, some sections you know, you may think, oh, this is all common sense. I don't need to get back to this one. Then just gonna kind of skim over, okay. But there are certainly you know sections that you probably want to keep an eye on. All right, that's it. I don't want to use up any more of your time. So instead of you know, talking about this in class, which is going to use up some you know, really precious um, lecture time, I'm just going to use a video and send it to you guys so that you can watch it before the first class. Oh, that <coughs> one more thing, because I forgot to mention one thing. So let's go back to attendance. Okay, there you go. Uh, okay, the nice thing about, oh, right there. All right, so the one important part about attendance that I need to mention like right now before the first class, hopefully you're watching this before the first class, is um, the first three classes are important. If anyone is missing any one of the first three class meetings, um, that's enough reason to be dropped. So make sure that you attend the first three classes because the um, absence allowance does not apply to the first three classes. The first three classes do not have an allowance. All right, so, okay, I'm glad that I caught myself you know, with that one. So with that all said, I'm gonna stop the recording and then send you guys the link to this recording. I look forward to seeing you all in class.